Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri. HBO's Room 104 has brought together idiosyncratic stories and storytellers for an anthology show that's quite different than anything else on TV. Mark Duplass and producer Sidney Fleischman bring the series back for its third season this Friday night, and it's just as strange, deranged, and heartfelt as seasons prior. Let's take a look. I want to meet him. No, 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 no. Don't open that. If you're gonna meet him, I want the mood to be right. It was supposed to be a special night. Now, I want you to sit down and I want you to turn off all the lights. Now you're mine. I get those goosebumps every time you come around you. You ease my mind, you make everything feel fun. You're the nicest person I've ever met. And it's just that movement of the brush. <laughs> I love this song, man. What? I just want to know if you'll be joining me in the dark. Oh, fuck that. Fuck that. I get those goosebumps every... You kindle living inside a kaleidoscope. I get those goosebumps every time. Come in. Come in. Everybody, please welcome Mark Duplass and Sydney Fleshman. Hi. Hello. 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 Uh, good to see you again. Thanks for coming good back. Good to see you too. Thanks for bringing your friend Sydney along. Hi. We have Sydney Fleischman. Happy to be here. Hello there. Uh, you have been a part of the show since the first season. You've worked with Mark uh, since Togetherness, or maybe even before that. Is yeah, that true? Since Togetherness. Yep. Uh, how did Room One Hundred and Four start? Where did the idea come from? Oh my God. Uh, I had this original idea. I would say uh, over 10 years ago. Um, and I was like, this will be a cool show that everybody's going to want to buy. And my agents were like, no one really knows who you are, and they're not going to let you make a show all in a hotel room and do whatever stories you want. And I was like, cool, 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 cool. So I put it away. And then uh, we went and made Togetherness. And then Sid and Jay and I were kind of talking about what we should do next. And I was like, guys, remember this thing? Do you think maybe they'll let us do this now and we're like probably not but we went into to HBO and we said listen we're gonna build a set of a hotel room we're gonna do every kind of story you can possibly imagine it's gonna be tonally all over the place and we're not even gonna really tell you about what the things we're making cool and they were like yeah and we we're like but no really and they were like yeah go for it and that's really our secret is we make this thing really cheaply and really quickly. And uh, we're like a little lottery ticket. That's you know? kind of been the Duplass secret for a, a It's not a, a secret anymore. Your, yeah. yeah, it's been out for like 20 years now. Yeah, yeah. Guys, here's the thing. <laughs> what I think is so, one of the things that I think is so wonderful about the show and baffling at first is you think of a Duplass Brothers production, you think of togetherness, you think of you know, the puffy chair, these sort of stripped down uh, emotional stories that are about intimacy and things between each other. And when you hear something that takes place in a hotel room, you think you're going to get a series of stories that's like a marriage falling apart or two brothers figuring something out or a brother and so And it's actually what much more mystical and stranger than that. When did that start developing or was that right off the bat? You knew that you wanted these stories to be a bit more off the beaten path. I think that was pretty early on that we realized, oh, we're going to use this to take some risks and try some weird things and see what sticks and and just try with new people and some old collaborators and just see what happens. Yeah, I think there's a this thing that happens when uh, we show up on set because we have the same crew each year. You know, they always say like, um, well, let's let's. Let's see what issues, um, you know, Mark and, and Sid and Jay are working through in their own personal lives this year. Uh, and those, those will end up in the episodes because we really don't have like a big writer's room or anything like that. It's, it's kind of just me and Sid and a few others coming up with the ideas. And then we sort of handpick a lot of our favorite filmmakers to come in and direct. And some of those are people we've worked with through the years, like, you know, Patrick Bryce, who's directed Creep for Us, or, or Sarah. It's like, I think, three or four yeah, episodes. He, he's season, done a, right? a ton of them. And then a lot of it is sort of giving those first-time directors 
their first crack at directing TV. For whatever reason, it's very hard to break into directing TV, probably because it's one of the best paid awesome jobs around maybe Get that um, DGA membership exactly yeah. and you know Sid and I had a discussion really early on of like this can be a place where we give a big swing to that 26 year old female filmmaker right out of Sundance who's made a short and no one is like giving them their shot and or that genius theater director in New York a hundred yeah. percent yeah and and then and what we get out of it, which is great, is like, yes, we're doing something cool to support them, but it's it's it so benefits us because at this point, like, I'm 42, I'm getting a little lazy with wh- how willing, how hard I'm willing to work on directing an episode of TV. I got my kids at home, and then this like 26 year old person comes in and they they prepare their asses off. They work so hard, and and it really everybody wins. How many episodes did you direct this season? I just did one this you season. The, and that is the one that, I mean, can we talk about? Yeah, we can talk about anything, yeah. That, that's the documentary episode, right? So that's the I, one no, I didn't direct, direct the oh, documentary episode. No, I directed this episode called uh, A New Song that's extremely oh, experimental. Yes. The script for A New Song was half a page. Um, I brought my favorite musician in whose name is Juliana Barwick, and she makes right. these abstract mood pieces uh, that she c- puts together on the spot. And so I said, okay, we're going to create a basic narrative, a storyline about a breakup that happened between um, her and her girlfriend and how it's affecting her songwriting. And we animated a bunch of potential storylines that could fit, and we projected them all over the walls. And then she started playing songs and building them together, and we shot them, and then we brought the character into the room and had an improvised interaction with them, which is like... Yeah, that's like a Matthew Barney installation. Like you don't get to do that on television, and that's you know a real testament to HBO, who they view this the way we view it. Is like, listen, this is like this is like a little fertile ground to like find new great filmmaking voices. They air us on on Friday night and in, in the weird slot, and they just like let us get our freak on, and it's kind of great. You say it's a testament to HBO, but I also think it's a testament to your filmmaking and what you've built because in somebody else's hands, that uh, that idea could might not be executed that well. Well, but you haven't I've seen, seen it the yet. episode. No, oh, I've you seen saw the it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah. and it's another one of those episodes where it's really hard at first to figure out where you're going and what this is, and then once you kind of realize it's a mood piece and a tonal thing. It's really beautiful and it absolutely works. I mean, for a person like me who embraces something like that, it really works, but I don't think it's just a testament to HBO. I mean, they expect that you're going to be able to execute these things because you've done it so many times. Yeah. I mean, the documentary episode you brought up was something that, I mean, you said you can talk more about that. That was a real journey for us. We were like, okay, it's season three. Let's try to step out. Let's get weird. Let's try some new things. And, um, that was kind of a big swing. Yeah, that one we, it's a father and son who are both artists and we wanted to do something with them in the room and we basically just brought them in and let them create and we just saw what happened. And so it was this big sort of leap of faith to say like, we know they're, we find these people entertaining we find them interesting and their story is really engaging and sweet and sad and so we just let them do their thing and it was really it was this risk, this like yeah. leap to see what would happen at the end. We of it. might not have an episode <laughs> when we're done here. Was kind of the feeling. How and, long did you shoot with them? Uh, we shot with them for a couple of days, and uh, most of these episodes shoot in two or three days. Um, that's part of how we keep it cheap, and it's obviously all in one set. So, you know, as we talk about how loosey goosey, creative, and fun it is, there's also a business aspect to this, which is. I have to go to HBO and say, give me creative freedom. I'm going to make this for a third of the cost of whatever thing you make because it's so cheap and contained. Um, and what the guys ended up doing in this documentary episode is they they pulled the box springs up um, and they used the bottoms of the box springs as their canvases to make a piece of art together. And the episode ends up becoming an episode about mental illness and what they've dealt with in, in their creativity and their artists and whether they are gonna be able to survive that and still be able to be creative and take the necessary medications that are required to keep their life on the rails, but also still be creative. And and I, that's what's just so wonderful about this show is um, when it's low pressure and low stakes and low cost, you can really take some, take some risks and try to find it. 
Um, the first episode of the season with Luke Wilson, uh, I love because it reminds me of the exact kind of thing I would have found on premium cable when I was like 11 years old and flipping through the channels. Like it looks like silk stockings or some sort of like low budget <laughs> semi, even though it's not soft core porn, like semi soft core porno. It, it, it is, like, it's very much inspired by the red shoe diaries. Thank you. The red uh, shoe diaries. Yeah, not, yes, I don't, yeah. maybe silk, no, silk stockings, stockings is the same thing. A little thing. later, but you know, yeah. But yeah, that that one was uh, it's sort of our origin episode. We finally sort of decided to tell, at least in some degree, how this room happened and why it is the way it is. Um, and we handed it over to Macon Blair, who's this wonderful filmmaker who made Blue Ruin, made I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. He's in his mid forties, grew up watching all the things you're talking about. I think he's actually doing the adaptation of uh, or the new Toxic Avenger. He, he is, yeah. It's very exciting. And um, and that's that that's one of those wonderful examples the of former where... trauma intern in He's very <laughs> like, excited yes! for that. Yeah. It's one of those great things you can do where we find a filmmaker we love and we say, listen, we want to tell the origin story of of this uh, motel. This is the year that it's set. This is what your set's going to look like. You have two characters. Here's the basic storyline. Go. You know? How much time do you usually give your writers to flesh out a script? Not nearly enough. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, they would probably all say not enough. Yeah. But, but some, sometimes it comes to them a little more fully baked, and sometimes uh, it truly is a turning over of the room. You know, Josephine Decker is this wonderful filmmaker who did an episode for us that is essentially a video diary episode. And, and we just, the crew, the entire crew was sitting outside of the room while she was in there with the iPhones filming herself and this episode, you know, with her collaborator. And that just came together on the spot. And that was very much me going to her saying, I know your relationship to sexuality. I know your relationship to doing nudity on screen. I know your relationship to emotions. It's so candid, it has so much integrity. I wanna support you. Here are the phones go and you just tell us when you need something. So sometimes it's as little as that. Sometimes, you know, it's the case of Sid and I will crack this idea and we'll be like, God, neither of us are right to write this episode, but if we give this to Patrick Bryce in the way that he relates to male odd relationships, he'll be perfect for it. So we have this kind of stable of people around us that we're constantly, you know, handing things to and and then as far as directors, we're always looking for new people to kind of kind of give them their first break, honestly. Has there been an instance where you had an idea for an episode, you brought it to somebody, and you still could not crack it, like the team that was working on it, and you had to move on to a different idea? Yeah. Yeah, we. I think that with a show like this, there are always more ideas than there are episodes. And so when we're in the early stages of developing it and just throwing ideas out, there are they're sort of like the graveyard of ideas that we've we've started to go down the path and then just couldn't couldn't quite figure it out. There are also those ideas that inherently come with a lot of pressure to them. Like whenever you're dealing with a, a show in a hotel room, you're inevitably waiting for that prostitution episode to come up. And because it is something you're expecting, we're like, if we're gonna do this, we better fucking do it really, really well and turn it on its head. And and so every time we've tried to dig in, we've always felt like this isn't original mm -hmm. enough or, or unique enough. And the, the specifically the process. Yeah, yeah. We, keep, we keep abandoning it, you know. So uh, there are things like that. Well, because it has been turned on its head so many times already. What I is it? Yeah. Well, how do you do it? Yeah. You know? we just do the straight angle. version of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the only way yeah, to do it. That's the only way to do it. Do the what? Just the straight version of Honestly, it. Honestly, not, if not we, turn it on its head. Maybe we just air an episode of Red Shoe Diaries <laughs> as it is. <laughs> Someone in the hotel room watching an That's episode it. of we, Red It's an over-the-shoulder shot of them watching it, and then they start to shake a little bit in the middle because that's, you know, when they're masturbating because that happens. <laughs> and then they turn it off, and then, I mean, that's, yeah, that's we, high we art, you guys. It. That's yeah. high art. Yeah. <laughs> The, the bad version of that would be he's watching Red Shoe Diaries, he falls asleep, and then is in that episode of Red Shoe Diaries in the... Actually, that's not, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Is that, I don't think it is. I feel like I've seen that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what has been the the hardest episode? Or do you go into each season with sort of like how you want to turn things on their head, how you want to change the show? Or do you feel like you already have that because each episode is different? That's a good question. There's usually this big discussion up in the attic of our office um, that's sort of like, it's the creative space that we crack a lot of our projects uh, that we do throughout the company. And we get up there and we start throwing out all the ideas that have occurred to us over the last year. 
And usually a, a grouping of 12 episodes start to present themselves. That's a little bit thematic. In the case of season three, it was really all about pushing the boundaries, getting as strange as we could, getting as experimental as we could, which is, you know, why we have... We have vampires. We have like a Spanish language alt melodrama. We have this musical dream space episode. We have, we finally deal with hygiene for the first time and that rash that you get <laughs> that you really don't want, uh, particularly in this case. Um, and, and so they, they kind of end up coming, coming together as, as a grouping. And then the, our job is to realize like, not every episode has to have a twist in order for it to be successful. Sometimes you can just play it very simply, but we have to do our best to keep audiences on their toes. And I, I've thought about this a lot, and Sid and I talk about this. We, we didn't realize how lucky we were gonna be with Room 104 being an anthology series where you don't know what kind of episode you're gonna get. It could be a thriller, it could be romance, it could be a comedy. And what that really means is that audiences are so actively engaged in the first five minutes of the episode, more so than you get in any other type of TV show, because they're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And we really sort of lucked into that. So we try to honor that as much as we can for our audiences and give back to the fact that they're really like leaning in for us. Well, that in itself can kind of be the twist, right? It's a twist that it's a documentary that this episode 100%. is a straight yeah. documentary yeah. there's no reason to suddenly be like actually it's not a documentary <laughs> yeah that's what they call a hat on a hat yeah. and we don't need that yeah when you are coming up with the 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 ideas in, in the attic uh do you find that you are hunting for a twist and it takes actual time to suddenly be like no actually we don't need a twist on this episode because as storytellers there is always that feeling of like what is the hook what is the angle yeah. what is the twist here yeah, I mean, there are definitely episodes that we sort of, like, twist into knots to figure out what it is and then have to unravel them and realize, like, oh, we didn't really need all of that excess. It was already sort of, it was all there. It's almost yeah. harder to deny yourself or the audience the twist in some ways because you're mm -hmm. taught so often that stories have to have all these beats and then there has to be a big reveal. And so it's it's almost harder to hesitate and pull away from that. Yeah, it, it's not uncommon. You know, I write a lot of the episodes. I probably, maybe I write about half of them maybe. Um, and it's not uncommon for me to, you know, go bang out a first draft, hand it to Sid, be really excited, and Sid will read it and be like, okay, like we're we're doing great until like page 19 um and then she will either feel me desperately trying to make a twist in order to make it more interesting um or you know laying back too much and almost all of our notes are are really focused from like that page 19 to page 24 mm -hmm. in that ending spot to feel how to land these things correctly because you know it's tricky you you can very very quickly end up looking like just another short film or one act play um, that's desperately trying to land itself. And that, that's where we spend most of our time trying to get it right. Yeah, I think that the building of an episode and the building up of these new characters and their world is that all comes really naturally and that's pretty easy. It's the trying to wrap it all up and feel like it has this satisfying ending without it being too much and it's the yeah. ending is always sort of that hard part to navigate and you know i mean for those of you who are making things i can't recommend this enough and i keep proselytizing this over the years like you don't know everything and you can't know on your own whether it's working or not so once we're done with episodes we invite 20 of our smart friends over usually have a filmmaker who brings a non-filmmaker with them we offer free pizza and we show them the episodes and they tell us honestly what's working and what's not. Um, and that is probably, beyond keeping things cheap, the other big secret of our company is figuring out that, uh, at least for us, auteurism doesn't really work. We can use our vision and get us to about 90%, mm -hmm. then we get lost, and then we have our smart friends tell us what to do. Well, auteurism is bullshit. I mean, even... I kind of <laughs> think it is, except for the fact that I saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I was like... Wait. But even that, look. He I, might <laughs> actually know exactly what to do. Yeah, look, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood <laughs> is a masterpiece. And like if, 
and a master class in movie making. Like, if, yes. if you don't think that you don't really like movies, so in my opinion. So let's just take that one and put yeah. that one away. <laughs> the exception if I think, that proves, yeah. proves the rule. If but I think I, about that too much, I have to yeah. kill myself. But I interviewed his collaborators, mm-hmm. and they're, uh, they even talk about his the way he collaborates and the questions that he asks of them okay. and what the script looked like before they shot it and the notes that were given him on, on the script. I'm sure he's maybe a bit more of an auteur than other film than some other filmmakers, but I yeah. still think there is a, a lot of figuring things out on the ground and asking questions and showing cuts. I mean, I believe the, uh, you know, there's like a, so an incredible amount of scenes missing from that movie. The, the, there, there are, I have, I have heard that there is a very long and violent murder scene of Brad Pitt's wife that they let, on the floor. Are you serious? Yes. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. I'm, probably, I'm yeah. kind of okay with that. That would have been challenging <laughs> but to see, that's, from that. But yeah. that is a, that, that's it's an, an example. incredible example that we can all look at and be like, well, that's a bad choice. Yeah, yeah. He may not have known that that was a bad choice yes. until he saw it and someone was like, hey, Q, maybe... Uh, oh, not you know, um, uh, we all love BP, but we don't love him that much. Right. Um, but yes, to your point, I mean, the sort of like collative, cr- creative collaboration and the, the little playground that is Room 104 has been... I think for us, like one of the most creative and like most rewarding experiences that I've had as as a filmmaker. We have the same crew every year. We bring in all these young filmmakers and new voices, and it's like I can make a hundred seasons of this show. It's really the one thing I keep coming back to. Yeah, and selfishly, we get to nothing ever gets stale. We get to work with all these new people, and it's yeah. constantly changing, and it's. After three days, we move on to the next episode. It's a, like a new team of creative people, and it's just always sort of re-energizing itself. How have you found it's affected, like writing 20 to 25-minute episodes, or singular stories, how has that affected your ability to write feature-length stories as well? Has it, has it made it easier? Has it, has it bettered your ability to write longer form? Here's the really tough, honest answer to that, is that um, it makes me realize that... Uh, a feature script is working at a much earlier stage, and then I get to tell myself, all right, this isn't going to be long enough for a feature, Mm. but it's going to make a great fucking Room 104 episode. (laughs) And it really is. Room 104 is a wonderful graveyard of where where a lot of my feature scripts have gone to die because I didn't realize (laughs) the stories weren't long enough. Um, Sid, so you you started working for uh, with Mark on Togetherness, right? Mm-hmm. And how did he bring you along on Room 104? How did this act like this real collaboration happen? Uh, I remember sitting at my desk, and I think you came up to me and said, "Hey, you want to develop this show with me?" And I'm pretty sure that that was the entire thing. It was really you just came up to me and said, "Let's let's start figuring out what this show is, what all these stories are going to be." Um, and then that's room, room 104 has pretty much been my life since then. Yeah, and I, you know, look, I can really speak to that because you know, Sid started out at our company as my assistant, um, and through togetherness, I got to see all like her creative wiles and the way her brain worked. And I remember talking to a couple of people. I was like, I think I'm going to have Sid run Room 104 with me. And they were like, she's way too young. She is not ready for this yet. She has not experienced stuff. And I was like, I know. And that's why she's going to be incredible because it's not a traditional show. She doesn't need the knowledge of old, big, expensive shows. She needs to be young and crack new ideas with me. And I think you became one of the youngest showrunners around. And I think that was part of what Congrats, made you so great amazing. at it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it really, thank you. like, yeah. Um, and, and it's been just so awesome watching you sort of, like, you know, as the years have gone by, like, really, like, take ownership of this show. And well, You're absolutely right. That's kind of the last thing that you would want on a show like this is someone who has that experience. Not that you didn't have experience, you have incredible experience with them. Not someone who's going to be like, so, ah, Mark, we can't do that. Yes. Like, we can't, we can't figure this out. We can't bring this in. Like, this is what the day is supposed to be, and it's, we're not going to be able to meet that. Yeah, du- Duplass Brothers, like, we've always been relatively uh, ignorant of the, of the rules of this industry, and I think that's been a good thing for us because we've just barreled our way into things being like, why can't we do it like this? And everyone's like, because well, you can't. And we go, but, but why? You know, because I don't know. It's, just, it's not how it's done. And I was like, okay, well... I made my schedule and budget on a piece of loose leaf. Is that okay? Sure, let's do it. You know. Did you find with togetherness that you bumped into that, that wall a little bit more, considering it was maybe the most 
um, I don't know, classically yeah. classically formed television show that, you, yeah. that you've done? Yeah, I, I had three experiences. One, making Cyrus for yes. Fox Searchlight. Two, making Jeff Lives at Home for Paramount. And three, making Togetherness for HBO that were more traditional models of making things. I was very lucky to have collaborators, like first ADs, assistant directors, producers, who knew me well and knew that I was going to have a hard time fitting into that world. So they acted as my sort of Pygmalion to like get me into the world and like and comfort me. So it wasn't as bad as it as it could have been. But it's not a um, an accident that I'm not making things in that model anymore. I am mostly comfortable with my homies making things cheap in my corner of the sandbox, my way. And you know, if uh, if a ton of people happen to show up and watch them, awesome. But if we're tucked away on a Friday night and and a couple of weirdos show up and watch them, that's cool too, because we're nice and cheap, and that's really my spot. Do you still have ideas for 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 those bigger things that come up? And if you do, do you put them aside or try to work them into something like Remote 104 or smaller movies? Or are you willing and able in the future to jump into a bigger thing like that again? Yeah, I, I think at this point in my career, I'm really enjoying like um, stepping out of like, I don't really direct a lot right now. Like I really like uh, fostering and team building, which is wh what Room 104 is. I really like putting together projects, giving people their shot, stepping away and being like, call me if you need me, if you get in trouble. But otherwise, like, Go, 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 you know? And um, I think that's keeping me more fresh. It's keeping me around younger people, keeping me from repeating myself. And that might change, you know, down the line. But I guess I'm really enjoying being more of a, of a grandparent to projects as opposed to, like, the parent who's, like, in there every day kind of thing. Uh, a couple questions from the audience right here. Hey. Um the League is like one of my favorite shows of all time. Really loved it. One thing you guys did was you would always make up your own phrases, coin terms. I want to know if you had a favorite from that series. And also, I want to know if you still do a fantasy football league with the castmates and who was the best. So um, we don't do fantasy football with the castmates. We did while we made while we made the show. And um, Steve Ranazizi was the most knowledgeable about football, but he inevitably came in last almost every year. And then my wife Katie was the least knowledgeable, and she won twice. Um, so that's just fantasy football and what that is. Um, and then um, yeah, the, the the catchphrases from the league. There's been a lot of them. The the one that really sticks with me that I love was uh, the phrase. Uh, it was shit sipper, um, but good three quarters of the fans thought it was shit zippers. So when I'm in the air f airports, I'm often just hear someone screaming shit zipper at me, which I kind of like better than shit zipper <laughs> now, actually. It, it makes no sense, but. Uh, next question. Hello. Uh, so you talk about how cool it is to kind of change it up each episode. Was there anything else kind of oddly freeing about being able to do a single story per episode rather than something that spans a whole season? Yeah, the whole thing is really freeing. I mean, we're not we're not tied to any storylines that we have to wrap up. We're not tied to any specific characters. The whole thing is really really liberating liberating because we can go anywhere, do anything. Yeah, I think that 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 whole theory of uh creative uh the creative process inside of limits is very, very freeing when you know, well, this is all I can do. I can only fit so many people in the room. I only got 22 minutes. I can only stay here. Um, when that is on top of you, it, you find yourself punching against it in a good way, and I, that really inspires me creatively. Um, I love the show, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Good Ricky. to see you. Thank nice you. to meet you. you Thanks too. for coming you, in. Man. Good to see you. You look handsome these days. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. You look good on. too. Ricky and I, I think, are I think we're like the same age, and so it's nice. I'm a little younger. It's nice seeing you. I'm I'm a, little, a little younger. <laughs> I think we're both. There's like little grays on the side. Little grays on the side. It's like, but every recently gotten gotten to some pretty good shape. Feeling yeah, we're, good. We're doing good, Ricky. We're doing all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, Room 104 premieres <laughs> this Friday night at 11 p.m. Please give Mark and Sydney a round of applause for being here. Thanks for being here, Thanks, guys. guys.